Activists condemn the UK for selling weapons to Riyadh just six months after a Saudi airstrike killed scores of Yemeni civilians. I'm Imran Garda and today's newsmaker is the UK arms trade. Britain is the second biggest arms dealer in the world, with most of its weapons fueling conflicts in the Middle East. But last year, a Saudi airstrike hit a funeral in Yemen. 140 people died, and that was enough to scare the UK trade minister. He reportedly was set to suspend sales of weapons to Riyadh. That is until Foreign Secretary Boris Johnson intervened. Johnson reportedly argued that there was no risk that British weapons would be used in serious breaches of international law. And with that, MPs approved a plan to sell the Saudis fighter jet components, bombs and missiles at a cost of $370 million. Much of the British public and human rights campaigners were incensed, asking what kind of disaster would need to take place for Britain to change its policy. Sandra Gatman has this report. In October last year, the world witnessed one of the deadliest attacks in Yemen since Saudi Arabia began its bombing campaign two years ago. A funeral hall was hit by an airstrike, killing 140 people. The Saudi-led coalition fighting Iran-backed Houthi rebels were already under fire for launching attacks that the UN has called indiscriminate. After the strike, a major arms sale from the UK to Saudi Arabia was halted by the UK's Trade Secretary Liam Fox. But according to The Guardian newspaper, Foreign Secretary Boris Johnson wrote to Fox, urging him to go ahead with the sale because the UK had received assurances from Saudi Arabia that there was no clear risk. Anti-arms trade campaigners say British-made bombs used in Yemen's war violate international law. They point to a finding last year that connected barrel bombs used by Saudi Arabia in Yemen to a British sale from the 1980s. They've also tried blocking future arms sales to the kingdom in London's High Court. But judges rejected the bid. I welcome the High Court judgment today. I think this shows that we are indeed, we do in this country, operate one of the most robust export control regimes in the world. The UK's government is under mounting pressure to reconsider its trade relationship with Saudi Arabia. Since taking office, Prime Minister Theresa May has been strengthening relations with Riyadh and other Gulf countries, hinting at economic benefits for Britain after Brexit. Saudi Arabia is the UK's most important weapons client. Since the country began its campaign in Yemen in March 2015, the UK has licensed 3.3 billion pounds worth of arms to the kingdom, including 2.2 billion in aircraft, helicopters and drones, 1.1 billion in grenades, bombs and missiles, and 430,000 pounds on armored vehicles and tanks. But campaigners say British arms and technical support sold to Saudi Arabia are prolonging the war and suffering on the ground. Saudi Arabia is a key ally of Britain's and the Saudi-led coalition has been killing children in Yemen and we really want that to stop and we also want it to be investigated where British muni munitions could be contributing towards some of those deaths. According to the United Nations, over 10,000 people have been killed in Yemen, most of them civilians. Schools and hospitals have been decimated, exacerbating a new outbreak of cholera. With millions displaced, many are making the case that what's needed now is more aid, not arms. Sandra Gatman, The Newsmakers. Let's go to our panel. Luke Coffey joins me from Washington, D.C. He was a special advisor to the U.K. Defense Minister from London. Andrew Smith, a media coordinator at the Campaign Against Arms Trade. Also in London is Barash Erban, who is a Yemeni human rights activist and political analyst. Let's start with the Yemeni on the panel. Barash Erban, is Britain complicit in war crimes? Uh, thank you. Um, I think, um, I mean, being a Yemeni myself, uh, coming from Yemen and currently living in London, I was able to view um, the discussion from, uh, from, from both sides. So from one side, uh, there is definitely a responsibility on Britain and the United States uh, on how uh, where like they need to of course reassess 
where are the uh, their weapons being sold to and how are they being used and if there are uh, any serious breaches of uh, 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 the international humanitarian law, like the situation in uh, in uh, uh, in Yemen, but also at the at the at the other side of the discussion, when most of the Yemeni people don't see that discussion very uh, very let's say essential uh, essential uh, for them. So simply, many uh, Yemeni people believe that actually, even if uh, Britain pulled out or uh, suspended. Uh, 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 selling weapons to uh, Saudi Arabia, that does not really affect the conflict inside the, inside the country because simply the conflict started a couple of months before the Saudi-led right. uh, led intervention. Um, so th there is definitely some responsibility, but also at the other side, uh, I think we're giving more credit to how, uh, uh, how much really this is affecting the situation on the, uh, Although, on the ground. Or let's sure. say, to be more precise, the conflict exactly. The, okay. the, the conflict Undoubtedly, but, but billions of dollars worth of arms sales can certainly contribute to a conflict. Luke Coffey, there was this airstrike. 140 people died. They were not fighters. This was a, a funeral in, you know, outside of Sana'a. After that, some soul searching in British society people were unsure about whether they wanted to be complicit in, in their government selling weapons to the country that did this bombing. Do you, don't you think that if it was left to its own devices and there wasn't the political interference of Boris Johnson, the UK would not be selling weapons to the Saudis? I don't think that's the case at all. Um, first, I think everyone on the panel agrees that the human suffering that's happening in Yemen is a serious cause for concern. No one would deny or dispute this. But the UK has some of the highest standards on selling uh, defensive weapons, weapons for war, of it, any country in the world. And this was actually reaffirmed a couple of weeks ago during a case uh, that was actually brought to the uh, High Court by the Campaign Against the Arms Trade when the High Court ruled that uh, there's no breach of international law, that the UK is maintaining very rigorous and high levels of standards in terms of its defense exports. So I don't think that um, if there was uh, the, this, this so-called public outcry, which actually I don't, I don't really, I didn't see any public outcry. Okay. I don't think well, let the me give you, person on let the me give you BMG really research. Okay, allow me to give you this. BMG research. But if, I, don't, I, I don't even hold think on. that there would have hold been a, a change in policy. Just a second, BMG research. 58% of Britain's polled said it's wrong for their country to arm Saudi Arabia. 64% want the government to release a secret report on Saudi's funding of extremism in Britain. Clearly there's a debate within the country and the majority of those polled don't like what's going on in Yemen. So that's the justification for saying there's an outcry. Was there no outcry? Well, that's a poll, that's a poll not an outrage. And the, the second uh, poll you mentioned is actually irrelevant to the discussion we're no, having today about because the legitimacy the, of British weapons. But that's the country, weapon, that's the, country weapons the weapons are being Saudi sold Arabia. to. It's the country the weapons are being sold to. Well, as I said, uh, Britain has had a long tradition of close military cooperation uh, relations with many countries in the Middle East, including Saudi Arabia. There are huge benefits to, uh, the, to the British defense industry for um, its Britain's defense exports. And as long as they're done in a legal and responsible way, there's nothing wrong with it. Okay. And the high court ruled a couple of weeks ago that Britain is, in fact, doing this in a responsible and legal way. Okay, so let's ask somebody from the group that is unhappy uh, about the high court's ruling. Andrew Smith, I know you're going to be appealing. What makes you so confident that your appeal will be successful? As Luke said, the high court ruled and you lost. Thank you. Well, on paper, UK arms export criteria is very clear. It says that if there is a, quote, clear risk, the arms, quote, might be used in a serious violation of international humanitarian law, and an arms sale should not go ahead. Now, Saudi Arabia has been widely accused of some of the most serious violations of international humanitarian law. We are talking about one of the most brutal dictatorships in the entire world, one of the most repressive regimes in the entire world. And it has waged a terrible bombardment, which has exacerbated the civil war which is taking place in Yemen and has seen multiple civilian casualties, thousands of people who have been killed. And in fact, the, the exact episode we're talking about, turning a funeral, a scene of mourning, into a massacre. That is not the actions of a regime that is doing everything it can to avoid civilian casualties.
Luke, are you convinced by any of that? <laughs> no. Uh, well, you know, the question is, are these, are these weapons that are being sold being used in an illegal manner? Um, is, it, is it the intent of, of, uh, of any country that buys these weapons from the UK to use them in an illegal way to purposely target civilians or not? And if this is the case, then, they, then the, the defense exports to these countries should stop. And I think the high court um, made its point very clear. But in, in all of this, um, you know, Andrew takes the point of view, takes an ideological point of view against all uh, defense sales full stop, right? But it completely ignores the benefits of the defense industry to the British economy. Well, Almost 300,000 uh, Brits on, either no, directly or indirectly I mean, we could, uh, serve no, we could talk about building, from the defense building the industry. Death Star to create jobs. That doesn't mean it's a good Let's thing, right? Can I well, if you're talking about, about high-end jobs, jobs, research and technology, um, scientific jobs, the, yeah, it is a good thing, especially if it's done and only when it's done in a legal and a responsible way, which is the case for the United Kingdom. Okay. Andrew, you want to come in? Yeah, I do. Um, on the point about jobs, we've just heard some very misleading stats. According to the ADS group, which is the Aerospace Defence and Security Group, a kind of trade body for arms companies, one which is highly unlikely to, un to understate a number on purpose, they have said that 55,000 jobs in the UK depend on arms exports. That's not 300,000. Now, of that 55,000 figure is actually about seven years old as well. So we can assume that the number's actually gone down slightly since then. What we're talking about is 0.2% of jobs in the economy. It's not the mass employer, which um, it's often talked about as. Now, these are some of the most skilled people working in the economy, mm -hmm. some of the most skilled engineers. We want to see their skills put to good use. The arms trade relies on a huge amount of support from government, both in terms of political support and financial support. There is a civil service department, the Defence and Security Organisation, which is specifically set up to promote the sale of arms abroad. We want to see these kinds of this kind of support being put into better, more sustainable industries rather than those which depend on war and conflict in order to make a profit. The UK arms some of the most brutal repressive regimes in the world. Taking the, uh, the civil war and bombing in Yemen, in the period since the bombardment began, the UK has actually licensed over £3.5 billion pounds worth right. of uh, weapons to Saudi Arabia, yeah. including fighter jets that are flying well, and bombs that are being dropped from the sky. Okay, very briefly, Luke, because I want to I want to broaden it out, but come like, in, Luke. A a Andrew, I, I, I don't, I don't want to bore the discussion with uh, the, uh, the, the, the facts and figures and the stats, but you, using seven-year-old figures is, an, um, is a very accurate way to portray the situation. Uh, the, this information I got comes from a King's College uh, report um, from 2015, and it's indirectly and direct. So those directly supporting the defense industry and all the SMEs and all the other smaller businesses who help with the supply chain, we're talking 300,000 jobs, more than half of which are high-skilled jobs, uh, with a turnover of 22 billion pounds a year. Okay. This is a serious industry certainly. for okay. the UK. But can and, we, and for, for the sake UK of this discussion, technology. certainly, for the sake of this discussion, even if it was fantastic for the British economy, that does not make the suffering of the people in Yemen any less real, right? So let's, let me kind of but, recalibrate but you're assuming this for a that second. The suffering, you're assuming that the suffering of the people in Yemen are con is connected directly to British defense sales. No, what we're and talking about is accountability. That, and that's why we're discussing it. And, and I tell you, I mean, this is, we're not taking perspectives here. If I had a chance, look, if I had the chance to hold to account somebody who was selling billions of dollars worth of weapons to the Houthis, I'd be very happy to put them on the show. This is not taking sides in the Saudi civil war, right? But I want to kind of well, refocus you find an Iranian, uh, uh, in, in the Yemeni civil war. And, and the Iranian influence over the Houthis does not compare when it comes to what we're seeing with the backing of the Saudi-led coalition. But if we had the opportunity, and we have done in the past, we've looked at that. But I want to broaden this out again, and I want to focus on the people of Yemen because I've got some extraordinary stats. 10,000 people killed, or more than 10,000, 3 million displaced, and now we've got the world's worst cholera outbreak in Yemen. Have a look at some of this. Since April, more than 400,000 people have been infected. Among them, about 2,000 people have died, and around half are under the age of 15 children at the center of this outbreak. Some of these pictures have been very hard to look at as well. Now, I want to ask you, Barra, 
when you look at this unimaginable suffering of the Yemeni people and you see that you have UN Security Council members who are backing one side in this conflict, how do you change anything, really? Is there the political will? Because things like cholera are the symptom of the conflict. How do you change anything when there doesn't seem to be the political appetite to bring this to an end? Uh, I think the problem is uh, you don't see actually, and I'm talking again from a from from a Yemeni perspective. You don't see a unified decision when it comes to uh, when it comes to Yemen. Yemen is usually being debated um, on the you know on the on the just in the back discussion of uh, of, uh, of Saudi Arabia, and if and, and 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 unfortunately most of the people who are involved. Uh, when they come to the discussion about Yemen, are actually interested in Saudi Arabia, not about uh, not about Yemen. Uh, the 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 only solution out of the current conflict is a political solution, and we have said that uh, repeatedly. And the only solution, if I want to be more precise, is for both parties to give a compromise. You have uh, uh, President Hadi and his deputy uh, should uh, uh, hand over in, ex in exchange for. Uh, the leader of the Houthis, Abdul Malik al Houthi, and the former president, Ali Abdullah Saleh, who's always missing in the discussion, by the way, uh, need to get out of the country. That's the only way that Yemen can get out of this, uh, out of this mess. Uh, the, there's also the component of the, local, uh, of the local councils that haven't been supported by uh, any of the UN, uh, UN agencies. Most of the UN funding is very concentrated at the very central level, and that's another problem. And that's why we have, when you have such an outbreak like cholera, there is a failure to quickly respond. Mm -hmm. And quickly be responsive to the uh, to the uh, to the to the problem. So we having a failure of a failure, and the international community are still discussing which side shall we back? Are we on the side of the Saudis, or are we back of the, or shall we, you know, or are we giving uh, more positive signs to the uh, to the right. uh, to the Iranians? And that's I think at the core of the Yemeni of the Yemeni problem. Yemen is missing from the uh, from the uh, uh, from the discussion. Again, the former president is still in the country. He right. have. Uh, uh, continued uh, and participated in the suffering of the Yemeni people, but he's always missing from the from the uh, from the discussion. And again, the only solution is a political solution. Even if we continue this war, I think for another year or two. Yeah, Andrew, isn't this at the heart of your problem because you're campaigning against the arms trade, whereas the political calculation that's being made by the UK government is that yes, we need a political solution, but according to their foreign policy right now. They want one side to win, which is why they're arming one side. They want to restore President Hadi to have control over the whole country, and this is why they believe it's justified in supporting the Saudi-led coalition selling weapons to them in order to ensure that Hadi and his Saudi allies and their allies win against the Houthis. That's a political solution. So you're campaigning against the kind of brick wall here, aren't you, Andrew? Well, we also want to see a political solution, but if the Saudi military solution was one which was going to work, then it would have worked already. For the last two and a half years, the civil war has been exacerbated, and the, and the bombardment has also played a key role in destroying vital infrastructure, including life-saving infrastructure. Schools and hospitals have been hit as well. Now, obviously, not all the atrocities being committed are being committed by Saudi forces, and that's one reason why it's a very good thing the UK rightly isn't arming the Houthis. But the longer the bombardment goes on for, we don't believe it's going to make a political, a political solution any more viable. But also, at the moment, it's worsening the humanitarian crisis which has been inflicted upon the people of Yemen. And we've seen some horrifying statistics. One you read, ones you read out were um, horrifying. We saw a report from UNICEF which came out last December saying that a child is dying of preventable causes every 10 minutes. This is the human cost of the, of the war. But it's not just the 10,000 people who've been killed as a direct result of the mm -hmm. conflict. And incidentally, that figure is almost a year old as well, as far as I'm aware. It's the people who are dying every day from preventable causes who simply do not need to be dying. Right. And Luke, I'm, I'm happy that you mentioned the High Court ruling earlier on because it shows that you, you, know, you, you trust legal ruling vis-a-vis uh, -vis, uh, a conflict, if it can be ruled or proved, Luke, that atrocities are being committed by the Saudi-led coalition using British weapons, would you rethink the support of the Saudi-led coalition by the UK government? Of course. I mean, th this should be without... In fact, I've, I've already stated this. Defense exports have to be done in a legal and responsible way. And if it's ever shown 
uh, connection between the, the, the use of, of uh, British uh, defense cells to Saudi Arabia used illegally uh, in Yemen, then of course uh, this should be reviewed and probably stopped. But this whole, this whole discussion, this whole debate we're having is based on two false assumptions. Firstly, that um, in fact uh, British defense weapons are being used against uh, 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 as part of atrocities in, in Yemen, which no link has been made. And the second, that Britain's only selling these weapons to Saudi Arabia because of the war in Yemen. I would say that that uh, has a very little, if any, um, significant part in the decision-making process on why Britain sells these weapons to Saudi Arabia. They sell these weapons to Saudi Arabia as part of a larger geopolitical context in the region for balance of power, considering the role of Iran's nefarious activities in the region, um, and as also a tool of foreign policy. And, and defense uh, exports are a legitimate tool of foreign policy. But I'll reiterate, so it's very clear, this has to be done only in a legal and responsible manner. Okay. And so far, that's what the high court ruled, and that's, and that's the case as it stands. Okay, L let me give our Yemeni on the panel, Bara, the final word here. We have less than a minute to go. I want <coughs> you to wrap us up, Bara. Uh, yeah, I think, uh, uh, quickly to say, uh, I understand where Andrew comes from, and I think that's a very valid point. If I'm a British a citizen, that would be very much concerning to see weapons being sold when there is actually an active, uh, an active conflict. My fear is that actually, if actually, uh, the Saudi-led coalition did pull out. If actually they even uh, managed to get uh, the uh, UK arms sales from suspending, they might find that actually the conflict is not ending and actually it is still going on. And then we're going to discuss this again and say, well, hey, what's happening? What's going on? Unless there is a comprehensive solution that actually ends the conflict, not actually just delays uh, delays the uh, the, uh, the the uh, the uh, the atrocities. We're we're going to meet again and again and still discuss about the same things. I'm afraid. Okay, we covered some important ground. I think Andrew Smith, Luke Coffey, and Barash Shaban. I really appreciate appreciate all of you coming on the program. Thanks so much. Coming up, we ask if Libya's new peace deal will actually lead to an end to hostilities. And we debate whether politicians are stoking ethnic tensions in Afghanistan. Welcome back to the Newsmakers. Leaders of Libya's rival governments have agreed to temporarily lay down their weapons during talks brokered by French President Emmanuel Macron. What's more, the UN-backed Prime Minister Fayez Asraj and military strongman Khalifa Haftar have agreed to hold elections early next year. Both camps hailed the deal as the closest step taken towards peace in years, but skeptics remain. Previous deals have been torn apart and followed by more bloodshed. Yvette McCullough has more. A handshake that could mark the beginnings of peace, as Libya's two main rivals agree to call the ceasefire following French brokered peace talks. Et je veux vous le dire avec beaucoup de solennité, le courage qui est le vôtre aujourd'hui, en étant présent ici et en agréant cette déclaration conjointe, est historique. Prime Minister of the UN-backed Government of National Accord, Fayez Al Sarraj and military strongman Khalifa Haftar released a joint statement saying they would only use force for counter-terrorism and would look to hold national elections as soon as possible. They also committed to building the rule of law and working towards the disarmament and reintegration of militia groups. Libya has been engulfed in violence and political turmoil since the 2011 uprising against Muammar Gaddafi. His overthrow left a power vacuum that different armed groups have been vying to fill. The country has also been divided by rival administrations, creating a lawless state that allowed militants, including Daesh, to gain a foothold and migrant smugglers to flourish. Je crois profondément que la guerre civile n'a rien d'inéluctable. Et par le dialogue, la paix peut l'emporter. C'est ce que l'étape d'aujourd'hui tente à démontrer dans les faits. But with a myriad of factions, alliances and militias, making these commitments into something concrete might be easier said than done.
Libya has been down this promising road before, but internal divisions and competing groups have destroyed other attempts at peace. This time there's concern that a date for elections wasn't set as part of the agreement, and that there could be a wide interpretation of what constitutes counter-terrorism. One of the sticking points to peace has been the weakness of the Government of National Accord, or GNA. While it has widespread international backing, Siraj has failed to spread his government's influence and seems to have limited control over the militias loyal to the GNA, raising questions over whether he could instruct them to honour any ceasefire. Another sticking point has been the role Haftar could play and who would control Libya's army. Haftar has refused to accept the GNA and supports Libya's elected parliament in Tobruk, and he has the backing of Egypt and the United Arab Emirates. His self-styled Libyan National Army dominates the east of the country, taking control of Benghazi earlier this month, seemingly putting Haftar in the position of having more to gain. Now, after failing to bring unity, Siraj will have to convince his supporters that the controversial strongman Haftar is now part of the solution. Will the ceasefire hold and help to bring Libya together? And are these the two players to be pinning Libya's hopes of peace on? Yvette McCullough, The Newsmakers. Well, joining me now from Oxford is Oliver Miles. He's a retired diplomat and former British ambassador to Libya. From Benghazi, Libyan historian Faraj Najem. And from London, Kumal Gamati. He's a Libyan academic and politician who heads the Tahrir Party in Libya and a member of the UN-backed Libyan political dialogue process. Gentlemen, thank you very much for joining us. Great to have you on the program. Gumal Gamati, let me begin with you. This is great news, right? There's a ceasefire. Well, I wish it was. I think uh, we will all welcome any breakthrough in the current political impasse uh, in Libya. We all want uh, to see the end of this bloody conflict. We want to see Libya united and Libya ending this transition period, turbulent <coughs> transition period, and start the proper job of state building, institution building, and a new uh, Libya that everybody wished for when they actually took part in the revolution in 2011. However, uh, what happened yesterday in, uh, in Paris is really much more uh, political hype than real substance uh, for a few reasons. I mean, what happened yesterday... Okay, give me the biggest reason. Is a, is a, okay, the biggest reason is that uh, Haftar and Faiz Sarraj are not the main or only... Uh, sides to the Libyan conflict. There are other very, very important sides to the Libyan conflict which have to be included if we are really going to have a sustainable breakthrough and a, a, a final uh, uh, solution. Also, we have the Libyan political uh, agreement as a framework which was signed in Skherat in 2015. I was there as a signatory mm -hmm. and that is still backed by the UN and all the main countries uh, and uh, any any diversion from that is just going to take us back to square one. Another point very quickly is that Sarraj and Haftar cannot hold any elections in Libya. Elections in Libya require, require legislation. We have never had okay. presidential elections in the modern history of Libya. So what are the rules? What are the conditions? We need Certainly. legislation for that and only, and only parliament can pass that legislation. Okay, so Faraj Najem, are you as pessimistic as Gumail Gamati? Uh, no, not much, but um, uh, I must say um, I am not uh, uh, very much intrigued by what happened in Paris. Uh, I think it's uh, more of a, of a, of a, a political uh, uh, photo opportunity uh, rather than substance. But anyway, um, uh, uh, any um, uh, meeting between Libyans, uh, one must has to welcome it. Um, I think uh, uh, Haftar certainly is a... Uh, uh, a, a very uh, sort of like an important uh, factor in the political but also, also the military landscape in Libya. Um, Sarraj, um, uh, yes, one has to agree that he is not the only uh, player, uh, especially in the west of the country, but uh, however he is backed by the international community. Uh, I don't think he can have uh, a better or high profile 
profiled leaders uh, than the than the, than right. those two leaders. Right. So uh, they are but, the two um, biggest ones. Um, yes. I think it's uh, it's a it's a it's a beginning, and maybe we can build on it. Okay. So it's a beginning, yes. according to Faraj Najib. Gumal Gamati is not so keen. Ambassador Miles, what is it? Is this a beginning? Is it a breakthrough? Or is it just? Was it a photo op to pad everyone's egos, including Emmanuel Macron's? Well, it's a bit of all those things, but I, and I agree with, with the uh, rather pessimistic comments from the other speakers. Uh, the, the fundamental point which they made and which is, one has to realize is that Libya is not just a, a dispute between two uh, parties or two people, two, two leaders. It's much more complicated than that in the sense that there are many independent forces in Libya, so-called militias, some of them more or less respectable, some of them virtually organized crime, and they have got to be persuaded somehow to lay down their arms and to resume life in a, in a more normal state. And if this is the beginning of that process, well, it's very, very welcome. I would only add to what they said that uh, it's more likely to succeed if it has international support, and so far that hasn't been forthcoming. I think that uh, Italy uh, has shown some slight resentment, perhaps, that at France st stealing, the, uh, stealing the lead in this, this game. Uh, I don't know what's happened to Britain and America and the other parties concerned. Uh, I think we all ought to be pulling together and trying to make it work. But I share mm -hmm. the doubts that have been expressed as to whether it can be made to work. Yeah, Gumal Gamati, it's interesting in, in terms of international support. So you had the UAE and Egypt supporting one side. You had Turkey, Qatar, the Sudanese supporting another side. Emmanuel Macron's the first one to kind of come together and say, hey, both of you get together and let's, let's talk. And many would say this is because of the neglect of his predecessors. And, you know, I remember Barack Obama criticizing Nicolas Sarkozy, criticizing David Cameron, saying that after Gaddafi was ousted, the Europeans just stopped paying attention. Tell me what it means to you, Guma, that the Europeans, through Macron, maybe as a first step, are now paying attention again. And it might be just because they don't want refugees on the continent. But how much does it mean to you as a Libyan? Well, I think it's very dangerous to, to allow only one country, albeit France, a major country, a member of the Security Council, to take charge of the Libyan conflict. The process we had for the last uh, almost two and a half years was UN-sponsored and UN-backed and, and supported by all the major uh, Western countries, America, UK, France, Italy, Germany, plus uh, uh, important Arab countries like Algeria and Egypt, but now for France to, to take charge, that, that is, go, uh, is not really uh, uh, very positive. We need the others to be on board as well. And here uh, a question uh, um, uh, imposes itself. Has the UK taken a back step? Has the US taken also a back step and, uh, and, and is now allowing France to take, to take the lead and take charge, whereas the US refused the same request to but Italy Duma, what if ago it, when Jill What if it works? What if it works? What if France leading this process works? Only if France proves that it's really uh, um, uh, totally uh, impartial and it's not taking sides. Because we know that France is leaning much more towards the Emirati Egyptian Haftar axis. Uh, uh, France has logistically and militarily supported Haftar. Last year, three French soldiers died in, uh, in life compact in west of Benghazi. So uh, that, that doesn't make it an honest broker. That's why we need all the other major countries to have a balance so that we, ca we have mm -hmm. an objective uh, uh, okay. backers uh, to, to, to the conflict. Okay, so, so let, me, let me take that and pose it to Faraj because I, I know he's going to disagree with you. Is that what's happening here with the French? Are they joining the UAE? Are they joining the Emiratis and the Egyptians and supporting Haftar rather than being honest brokers? No, it's, uh, I mean, the other side's camp uh, sees this is a, um, a, a collective international effort leaning towards uh, Sarraj more than uh, uh, the, the other side. Uh, I think uh, uh, lots of people here, they doubt that um, uh, why these countries are uh, supporting Sarraj so much, uh, while the man, he does not enjoy uh, 
the popularity and the political geography uh, that uh, Haftar is, is in and enjoying. Um, so it's, um, uh, I think uh, France um, has shown uh, to, till now uh, an even handed uh, handedness in dealing with the Libyan uh, case uh, as far as uh, Italy, for example, or, or Britain, uh, you know, uh, concerned uh, in terms of their involvement in Libya. Uh, Italy has shown its uh, uh, total bias towards uh, the other camp, mm -hmm. the camp that's opposing uh, uh, the military uh, solution to, to, to the problem of, of terrorism in Libya. Uh, the UK, we know that uh, it's, it's not uh, really helping uh, in, in uh, either the legitimacy represented by the, by the House of Representation in, uh, in, in Tobruk, uh, neither the, uh, the military campaign against terror. So, um, uh, uh, but uh, again, the, uh, the, the, the British, the Italians have left uh, a vacuum in the east, and therefore this vacuum is being filled uh, yep. by the Russians, the, 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 the French, uh, the Americas are coming on board now, uh, and, and the Egyptians and the Emirates are, are well placed in it. Okay, so Gumat, would you accept that there was a vacuum and that as Haftar has gained more ground, he's gained more support, and one of the reasons he's gained a lot of support from people and tribes is because he's smashing a lot of the takfiri groups, a lot of the extremist groups. Would you concede that? It's a total misrepresentation to say that the camp opposed to Haftar is the camp who is also opposed to a military solution to fighting terrorism. Let me remind everybody that the biggest IS presence outside Iraq and Syria was in CERT. And it was the GNA and the camp opposing to Haftar who fought IS in CERT mm -hmm. and eradicated them and liberated the, the city totally and, and took it back from them and probably reduced the presence of IS and their danger in Libya by almost 90 percent. Haftar has been fighting IS and other elements in Benghazi for the last three years, and he's only achieved uh, success after three years of, of probably the, at the cost of destroying half of the city. So to say that the opposing camp are actually playing with, with, with terrorists and, and they are uh, uh, abusing them and they are not fighting them, that's a total misrepresentation. Okay, but that wasn't, to do. That wasn't, that's the, that's that wasn't the built kind, into the, that's into the, the implication. In, I wasn't implying that in the question. I think you read too much into the question. I was merely asking your opinion on Haftar and his success and to what you attributed that, but I can understand where you're coming from. Let me ask Ambassador Oliver Miles. We're seeing this guy, I mean, clearly, Guma's not a fan of Haftar, right? Ambassador Oliver Miles, we, we see this kind of secular strong man who's... I'm, who's I'm uh, not a fan of dictators, period. Okay, fair enough, fair enough. I'm not Oliver Miles, certainly. And I, okay, let me ask Oliver Miles. So we see the secular strong man who's fighting the Islamists, the radical Islamists, right? And that's why um, international backers are putting their money on him because he's our strong man, and even if he might be brutal, there's accusations that his uh, forces have committed atrocities and so on. We've seen this movie before, haven't we, Ambassador? It never ends well. I'm afraid I agree with Guma on, on this point. I think that that's a mis misrepresentation. The idea that Libya is divided into secularists and uh, Islamists, with the secularists led by, by uh, Haftar and the, the Islamists led by Siraj, is a myth. It's not like that at all. Libya is not deeply divided, as a matter of fact, mm -hmm. between secularists and, and Islamists, but to the extent that it is, there are representatives of both in both parties. And Goma is quite right that the decisive military action against the uh, Daesh presence in Libya was taken not by Haftar, but by the Misurata forces who were operating under the aegis of the uh, government of national accord. Okay, so Faraj Najm, can you understand the skepticism over Haftar from the other two gentlemen? Well, I didn't think it's justified. I know that um, Haftar was the first to start uh, uh, this campaign against terror uh, back in 2014. Uh, the rest they followed. Uh, we must remember that um, uh, those terrorists that we were fighting in Benghazi, uh, they were described as revolutionaries and they were uh, supported by uh, some, some elements in the West. They did not believe that they were terrorists and they were ISIS affiliates uh, until uh, they, uh, they, 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 they confronted them uh, in the West. 
uh, yes, we totally agree that uh, there was a major uh, contribution to the war against terror in Sirte. No one can deny this. Uh, but uh, there are elements that, uh, who supported those, and they have to atone. They have to uh, admit that they, they were wrong. And Marishal Haftar, he is the one who stood up uh, with the people of Benghazi and the East, and, and supported by most Libyans uh, against those radical elements. Uh, they still remnants amongst uh, embedded in amongst militias in the West. Uh, we need to do something about it. Uh, however, uh, one of the things which struck me most in the agreement in Paris, if it was, uh, that uh, Haftar and Sarraj all signed uh, to, uh, I think, point three, where they all agreed that uh, Libya should be a civil, uh, democratic uh, state uh, ruled by uh, by elected politicians, uh, and that's the, the crunch of the matter, you know. We're all aiming for a, a country that is going to be democratic, is going to be civil, okay. uh, but uh, free of militias and, and, and terrorist thugs. Okay. There's less than a minute to go, so I want Guma to come in for the final word. Please, Guma, in under 30 seconds. Have a go. The biggest worry in Libya is the uh, Emirati Egyptian-sponsored project to actually get Haftar to take total control of Libya and establish a military dictatorship which will serve the agendas and interests of Egypt and Emiratis. If we can prevent that, then Libyans can come together and can agree and can compromise and have a totally indigenous Libyan solution to their problem. And that way, Libya stands a good chance to succeed in the future. Yeah, for what it's worth, we all hope the ceasefire holds. It means less war, destruction death, and hopefully it leads to a lasting peace. Ambassador Oliver Miles, Faraj Najm, and Gumal Gamati, it's been a pleasure talking to all of you. Thank you very much. We will not give up until we achieve our rights. We don't want our rights to be violated. We want our rights as promised by President Ashraf Ghani and Chief Executive Abdullah. Afghanistan suffered another set of Taliban attacks this week. At least 26 soldiers were killed at an army base in Kandahar. And two districts in northern and central Afghanistan were overrun after days of fighting. As attacks become more frequent, human rights campaigners say a major hindrance to the country's security is not only the growing threat from the Taliban, but a game of identity politics that is eroding the government's ability to keep people safe. They say that minorities are repressed, and that Pashtuns dominate Ashraf Ghani's inner circle. Well, joining me now from Dubai is Fatima Gailani. She's the head of the Red Crescent Society's programs in GCC countries, and she once oversaw its operations in Afghanistan. Fatima Gailani, great to have you on the program. So we've seen these attacks in Kandahar, attacks across the country, Taliban resurgent, Daesh even resurgent in Afghanistan. There are those that say it's being made worse by the fact that the government is being tribal, that it's preferring... Pashtuns, to Tajiks, to Uzbeks, to Hazaras and others. Is that happening and are they making it worse? Absolutely not. Look at the Afghan constitution. Every ethnic group, every sect in Islam has been uh, dealt with uh, very uh, fairly and uh, we live together for centuries. Uh, look at the cabinet. We have uh, Shias in the cabinet. We have Sunnis, Pashtuns, Tajik, Uzbeks. Uh, women, uh, young people, with people with experience. This is absolutely untrue. And uh, it is possible that some people, they will have it in their heart to play this game. But I don't think that this is a game from the government or from those people who are mm -hmm. uh, seriously in politics. And I understand you helped draft that constitution. Is it possible that the constitution is fantastic on paper? But in practice, the Afghan government is struggling to actually get it to express itself in proper politics, and we're seeing the old tribalism come back. Well, I mean, look at the, uh, the composition of the, uh, of the government, the cabinet, whether it was during President Karzai or today during President uh, Ghani. Look at it. Which other country around us will have that kind of small minorities, whether it is ethnic minority or in uh, minority in uh, Islam sects, uh, uh, accommodated in the, uh, in the government. 
now I am again saying that this is not a policy of not just the government, it is not the policy of anyone who wants to have a, a credible future in the politics of Afghanistan. Mm -hmm. It is not working. Yes, from outside, from the day one that the Soviet invasion happened in Afghanistan, uh, it has been tried over and over again that the languages of Afghanistan, that beauty of Afghanistan, that different ethnic groups, different languages, and the different sects of Islam should be played and people should fight over it. Mm -hmm. Sometimes they succeeded, but overall they didn't succeed. Right. Anything which happens in the streets of Kabul, whether it is a car bomb, whether it is a road um, mine, it has only the biggest uh, result, which is the victims are civilians. Right. And those civilians, they don't, uh, when they die, no one asks them that they have what language they speak, yeah. what ethnic group they, they belong to. Everyone dies in those kind of right. things. Right. Un understood. And, and before I, I move on to asking you who's to blame for these, attacks if you just allow me to mention again that a few weeks ago there was a there was a meeting in Istanbul uh, between many Afghan tribal leaders Uzbeks Hazaras Tajiks they felt they were being sidelined in Kabul by what they termed a sort of Pashtun clique there are those who also say that Ahmed Zia Masood a Tajik was fired by Ashraf Ghani because he's a Tajik and because the balance of power is now predominantly with Pashtuns Tell, what's your message to them that they're wrong? If you could directly speak to them. Well, yes, well, actually, you know that uh, I keep a very neutral view. And uh, I would uh, be very sorry if I hear that uh, from them, because they have played a very important role in the politics, politics of Afghanistan yesterday and today. I mean, these same people that you named them, they had very important post after the presidency. Majority of people in Afghanistan, they believe that we have to be fair. We believe that our vote should not be one more than one. My ideas, my ethnic groups should not have more force than mm -hmm. one vote and that's it. I come from the smallest uh, ethnic group of Afghanistan, which are the Arabs of Afghanistan. I never felt that I was marginalized. I got the post and the uh, status that was worthy of my, uh, my mm -hmm. capacity and my capability. And I don't think the others will do that. Now, let me so ask you, okay, fair enough, fair enough. And, and I think you've emphatically you know, said it and we, we know where you stand on this issue. The, the security situation is horrendous in the country. So many people are absolutely depressed about what's going on in Afghanistan after so much hope. Uh, we see bombs in the capital, bombs in the south, bombs everywhere. Nobody is safe. Who do you blame for that insecurity? Is it the president? Well, uh, it's very easy. Uh, it is very easy to turn the, the finger to the president or and the government in general. But uh, my hope is that, yes, uh, my hope was uh, that the security will become better than uh, during President Karzai, and I hope, I still hope that it should become better. I, as the former president of the Afghan Red Christian Society, I saw what happens to those families. I dealt with those widows. We took under the wing of the, our national uh, society, the Afghan Red Christian Society, those orphans that overnight they, they lost everyone. Quite frankly, whoever's fault it is, we have to do our best. It is very easy to say whose fault, mm -hmm. or sometimes it's very difficult to say whose fault because we don't know. But one thing I know, that if we are sincere, not just Afghans within the country, but our neighbors, our friends, those who help us, if all of us will try and give a chance for peace, inshallah it will happen. People of Afghanistan has no desire better than peace and security. When they send their children to school, they don't know if they are coming back or not. So Afghanistan should not be safe only for those people sitting in armored cars. It should be safe for everybody. The Taliban? Every Afghan, certainly no matter what language they speak, certainly. no matter what ethnic group they have. I, I, I want to ask you very briefly, 
in the shortest way possible. The Taliban is resurgent. They control a big chunk of the country. Would you ever consider them to be brothers as a part of the future solution of the country? When we talk about peace, we have to talk with everybody. If we don't talk with everybody, then peace with whom? This is my answer. Mm -hmm. Fatima Gelani, it's been a pleasure talking to you. Thank you very much for taking the time, ma'am. Thank you.